Welcome to What Is It About the Weather, where once a week we get together and explore the many ways that weather is woven into the fabric of our lives. I'm your host, Mark Jelinek, and this week we're going to be exploring the weather energy relationship and whether it's renewable. But before we jump into the main topic, as always, let me take a moment and say thank you to the many of you who are supporting the podcast. Can you believe it? A hundred weeks. That's right. With this episode, we've reached 100 weeks of you and I having conversations. Now, not all of those have been the long-form podcasts like you're listening to here. There's a couple briefer episodes back in the beginning. And as many of you who have been around since the very beginning know, there was that alternation between video and audio podcasts that we were doing for a while. So we've still got 100 episode, if you will, of, of the What Is It About the Weather main podcast to come. Uh, I guess, you know, if we do the math, we're on 84 now, so, you know, 16 more weeks or whatever. But nonetheless, 100 weeks of us coming together. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. For those of you who have taken the time, whether it's financially or promoting the podcast or sharing your feedback and ideas in whichever way You've taken a moment to be a part of the podcast and offer your support. It is greatly appreciated. For those of you who have not taken that step, you can learn more about supporting the podcast at whatisitaboutTheweather.com slash support. Now, my intertwined weather week, well, it, it was all over the place. I mean, there, there are a lot of things going on. You know, we had the, was it really a weather thing, right? We had the big, I still get this name, what was it? super blue blood moon or whatever that some saw some great pictures from some people I follow on Twitter I also saw a lot of fakes I guess that's the day and age in which we live right always drives me nuts I, mm, I'm glad I know people who are actually out there taking some real pictures and that I can count on to, to give me a real view of what they saw I didn't get really a chance to see it we had a little bit of here in the Atlanta area but it was kind of in a setting situation so it wasn't going to be like you know the solar eclipse was a few months ago and we had a few clouds so I kind of passed and and watched some of the live or the live or the live streams that were going on to catch what what was happening real time I think probably the the biggest thing I had going on this week you've heard me mention from time to time that you know we've got different weather podcasts out there and we've got National Weather Podcast Month coming up and I was doing some things associated with that that'll be next month so March again just like last year, so March 2018. And besides helping some, on the technical back end, getting the web page kind of started and that, that sort of thing, I had the opportunity to be interviewed for a podcast that wasn't part of the group last year. And it technically, I guess they're not specifically a weather-only podcast, although recently they've been focusing on the world of meteorologists. It's called In the Elements. And one of the hosts is also one of the hosts from the Weather Junkies, who you've heard me mention before, Dakota Smith. But I had a chance to be interviewed by Becky, who's the other host of, of the podcast. And that'll be, I think they're going to release it in March. So I'll, I'll let you know when that comes out. But it was a good time having a chance to talk about it. But they've also recently, and I'll put a link in the show notes, this past week, put something out about um, mental health in meteorology and it's the first episodes out it's going to be a two-part series I highly recommend catching it I, I think it's great that we live in a day and age where people are finally able I guess to talk about openly or more openly than in the past the challenges of mental health and meteorology like many professions has some very high stress elements to it. No, not everybody in meteorology deals with the same things. But for a lot of folks, it is about life saving, right? And that presents certain challenges, but just life in general. So, you know, it's meteorologists are people too, and it's a it's a good opportunity to understand and explore that kind of combination. So I do recommend checking out the series if it's something you haven't heard about before. Again, link in the show notes if you're interested. Now Let's jump to the main topic, right? Enough of me ranting about different things and going on seemingly in no direction. Let's zero in on this weather energy relationship. 
Now, you've known for a long time that I've been trying to figure out the best way to bring different sectors, you know, that we focus on in meteorology to you as the audience. And it's not always the easiest thing to do because it is, a, it can, I guess, get very much into the business of the weather enterprise, as we call it. But it doesn't necessarily have to. And energy is one that I was going to, you know, probably start with. It's been on my to talk about list since way back in the teen episode. So way back in the beginning in, in 2016. Yet I couldn't find the right thing I wanted to do. I thought about interviewing somebody who was a meteorologist in the sector, and I may still do that. But I really wanted to maybe figure out a topic that I could use as an introduction to at least give you a bird's eye view if you're not maybe as familiar with it. And even if you are, maybe have a perspective on it that you don't deal with every day. So again, wanting to have that kind of broad perspective to kind of catch everybody's brain and mind a little bit if we can. So I went down this path of, of different things and different ways to do it. And lo and behold, I ended up going with insurance first that I did in the fall of last year, because when we were dealing with all the disasters and everything, it made a lot of sense to kind of cover that industry. You know, it was relevant. It was some prominent news stories. It made it a little easier to relate. But I finally had three things happen over the past few months, very much about energy and weather that have hit me in, in life in general. And the, the first one happened just this past weekend. And it was a reminder that I needed to get back to this episode. So here I was watching a sci-fi movie, right? You guys know I, I like to do that, was catching Blade Runner 2049. And in the opening scene, you know, he's in his little flying car doohickey thingy. I'm assuming it's called a flying car. They probably have some better name for it, but it kind of looks like a car. It's got some neat sort of 50-ish tail fin sort of looking things on it too. I digress. But he is flying over kind of these big landscapes in this movie if you if you haven't seen it it's every bit of the two hours and 43 minutes kind of reminds me a lot of the movie 2001 so there's a lot of time to ponder I guess if you will when you're when you're watching the movie which I think can be good so you get really real time to reflect so not a tremendous amount of action scenes there, there are some in there but there's a lot of time to hear things and, and reflect on it. And even in the beginning, they have this opening scene, like I was saying, and they're flying over these huge, what look to be abandoned, and I'm assuming they're abandoned, solar collector farms. All right, so this is set in California, so assume this is Southern California. Now, I don't, if if I remember correctly, when I looked up, you know, where they filmed it, they did actually do some filming of a of a real solar collecting farm, but, you know, it was in a different location. I think it was in Europe or something like that. But the idea of them being abandoned, because there's, in this case, there's not enough sun to justify them anymore. So what good are they? And it kind of hit on that thing. Weather got in the way. Weather got in the way of these things being useful at all anymore. And probably in the last couple of weeks, sometimes I was reading an article that was talking about, now th this is... I always, you know, have to put in perspective where the source of the article is. It was written in a green business journal sort of environment, so I'm not surprised. But they were talking about, has natural gas, you know, are we seeing the beginning of the end of natural gas? Now, as a lot of people know, natural gas has become a very popular fuel. It certainly is here in the United States, but in many areas around the world. It's considered a clean fuel, relatively speaking. But it's a very prominent fuel, has a lot to do with the energy weather markets today, right? So more on the demand side, and, you know, you got more traditional supply demand side things. So if you know, you're know you in an area that's going to have a lot of demand for natural gas, you know, you're watching the weather for that, how it might influence the markets. So it's not so much in the creation of that fuel, but it is certainly in the supply demand side economics of that fuel you know how much is available where are the different elements coming from and a lot of times those are weather influenced right maybe not on supply although let's be realistic 
It can also happen on supply as well, and we'll talk about that a little bit more. And then the third thing, of course, was when I was on the vacation, and we talk, I talk about these solar collectors. Now, when I was driving back through Nevada, back towards the Vegas airport, in southern parts of Utah, you see a lot of solar farms. Now, it's not the collector style I was talking about. It's more of a traditional panel style. But I was reminded again, you know, here we were. They were we were dealing with these fires that had come up in that region. And I started to wonder how much of an influence the smoke, which essentially is creating a cloud layer, might be having on the quality and the efficiency of those solar panels. So here we are, something very fundamental, sun. We think about it being in certain places, and here we are in a very sunny area. But even there, there was these challenges that were coming up. Now, fires aren't necessarily directly a weather thing, but they created a weather-like effect that we also saw on the Blade Runner movie, which is less availability of sun. So all these things started me thinking about just this whole relationship with weather and energy. So you really don't have to dive too, too much in the business, if you will, of what is the weather energy market per se, or, you know, that business side of it, that we can explore kind of this renewable relationship. And is it continuing to renew and what's it going to look like going forward? So let's talk about that a bit more, but I, I guess we should also put context. As I've mentioned before, my background when I first got started in meteorology was very focused in the energy sector. Now, the time I went back to grad school was the time we had the big 2005 hurricane season in, here in North America. And there was a lot of challenges both in the Gulf of Mexico with platforms, so oil and gas platforms, but also in the refineries, which usually are located somewhat close to shore when you've got these areas where either there might be a shipping connection and or supply coming in. And we certainly have that along the Gulf Coast. And so in 2005, this caused a huge spike in prices. As you can imagine, not only was it a challenge on the actual creation, so this is my example, so weather, something you wouldn't think about, oil and gas, here it was, weather was influencing the supply side from a creation standpoint, but it was also impacting things from a distribution standpoint because we have this challenge where you know, things are often distributed by pipelines. And if the energy isn't available to be sent via these pipelines, well, it's just not available. And you can imagine that even on transmission side. It's, it's not hard to imagine at all, right? Utility companies, when they deal with down power lines from a variety of different weather types, right? Whether it's hurricanes, like we saw, you know, with what happened in Puerto Rico and how it decimated their whole infrastructure, including the power system. Or it could be an ice storm, like we experienced in Atlanta a few weeks back, where people here lost power because of weighted down lines or trees that were weighted down that then snapped power lines, etc. So even in traditional fuels that you don't think about being as renewable energy, there is this supply-side challenge that weather touches, and it touches in a variety of ways, like we just talked about. It's always been easier, I think, for people to imagine the demand side element. You know, it's cold outside. People need to heat. Or it's really hot outside. People need to cool. All those influence energy demand. And understanding that and understanding those peaks and those turbulent times or whenever there's a volatility component, that's going to certainly impact the markets. So, again, the weather energy markets not so much on the creation or distribution, but how much might be needed. So again, all my work back in the beginning, whether it started with tropical cyclones or it moved on to other things, was very focused on this energy market or this energy company, if you will, component to it. It's a lot of where I got my background, and I know just lots of people in that field, whether it's people who work for energy companies, whether it's people who work for energy trading companies, whether it's people who work in supplying forecasts to those energy sectors. And that's why sometimes it's hard for me to kind of pull back and look at an element like this, which is, you know, maybe what's more core, what's more fundamental is how has this relationship changed and evolved over time? Now, 
energy and weather have a long, long history, right? You can even imagine things that you've seen in old movies or read about, about how wind, for a very, very long time, wind itself has been utilized in the creation of energy. Certainly water as well. Now, I I know some people don't think about water as necessarily being weather-related, but let's be realistic. Most of the water that's used in these energy platforms today, uh, that may change, comes from weather-derived sources, whether it's rain or whether it's snow that then melts during the snow melt season. Yes, reservoirs are built to hold some of that water, but for the most part, at some point, snow came down or rain came down and it delivered it to where it could be stored. So weather's still involved. And even forecasting on those longer time scales for these sort of things. And, you know, we're dealing with a, this tremendous drought right now in South Africa. Very weather-related. Water is being consumed. I mean, it's creating human energy. That's another way, I guess, to think about the energy-weather relationship. But it has the potential to impact any hydro creation that might be going on as well. So we have this long historic view, long before we think about any of the fossil fuels that we use today. Weather and energy fundamentally had this very basic core relationship. You move forward in time to the things that we've talked about, and you have all the elements of of what's gone on in the last, I don't know, 30 years or so, as weather forecasts have continued to get better, help us understand what the potential impacts can be in influencing our ability to create energy, to receive energy, to trade energy, whichever it might be that you're involved in. Weather is, it's it's hard to imagine, I guess, separating weather out. Yes, there are times when weather is not the main driver. No doubt about it. But weather plays a key role in each of those things, and it's particularly important when there are these extreme events going on that can influence any of these parts of the energy source to the energy delivery process. Now, what I started thinking about, though, is where where are we going from here? You know, we, we talk about renewables a lot, and hence kind of that name in the title. But what's that relationship going to look like? And, you know, the reason I bring that up is that article I mentioned about natural gas. I I don't know enough to know if we're seeing the beginning of the end of natural gas. I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. But there certainly have been a lot of emphasis in the last 10 years, let's say, on renewable sources of energy. Now, hydro is one we've been very familiar with for a long time. It's kind of the old standard. And actually, you know, you think about a lot of power generation that's been going on for decades. Hydro in many locations was a big component of the energy cycle before the fossil fuels became so prominent. But now we talk about these new different types. Winds. Again, wind farms aren't new, but just the prevalence that they're taking on in the energy mix. So a lot of people are very focused on wind and you hear more about offshore wind farms. You know, you can, uh, there's famous maps now about, you know, wind profiles in different locations, but wind creation is, you could just imagine is how important creating a quality wind forecast is so that you can understand if the wind's not going to be available, particularly in places where you kind of count on it like in areas where they tend to build wind farms. How do you handle that? How do you deal with it? And that's a very real issue as well. So here we are trying to create energy. And what's going to happen if the wind forecast is showing a shortfall? And how far in advance can we forecast with quality those wind forecasts? And I can tell you from having worked on it some, that it's not the easiest thing in the world. Weather forecasting in general, of course, is not the easiest thing in the world. But wind presents particular challenges that the models that may handle temperature well were struggling on the timescales and the resolution that was needed for a lot of the wind forecast. So that being able to forecast that and do it better is a critical component of where we are today. And in trying to improve that is where we are today. And of course, going forward, I think solar is going to be a piece of that. Now, 
if we have the Blade Runner scenario where we have this kind of nuclear winter, or that's the way it was almost presented. And I don't know enough, again, about the back line of what they're saying in Blade Runner happened. But conceptually, solar was a big piece of it until we went into this thing where weather got in the way. And as you can imagine, it's easy to envision solar if we get good enough at it and efficient enough with it. It's kind of an ideal source, right? Sun sends us all sorts of energy. Why not take advantage of it? The challenge, like a wind farm or like hydro as its predecessors, is even if you can do it cost effectively, there generally is only so many places you can do it, at least where the technology is today. You need to have these locations that have sun available all the time. You can't really afford for weather to be getting in the way. You know, you can only have so much cloud cover. So, for instance, where I am, we get you know tons of sunny days. But there's enough other weather that it makes my region not particularly a good source. However, if you go to places like where I was visiting in Nevada, generally speaking, weather gets in the way a lot less. Or, again, it's more predictable or less susceptible to weather influences. And I think that's the key is they're looking for that. Now, wind can still have the same challenges because a lot of times when you when you hear about these solar collectors or solar farms, they are set up in locations that tend to be more arid, which also means they tend to be more desert-like quite often. Which also means that if you have wind, along with lack of vegetation, that you got a lot of debris and dust that can pit and ruin the surface of the solar collectors or solar panels. Again, another problem. Again, weather derived. So weather, maybe not in the short term, maybe that doesn't do anything to the collecting on a daily basis, but it might be in terms of planning and understanding how your investment's going to pan out over a period of time. Right? So we have all these elements. And I think, you know, where we look for in the future, and I, I guess people are always, you know, what's it going to be like? Is weather going to continue to be this constant interference or influence or major factor in the energy cycle? Whether it's in creation, you know, may, maybe we say we move away from wind power and we move away from hydro and we move away from you know anything that that might have weather as a creative influence but then like i said you get back to these same things that weather can impact distribution in ways that you don't necessarily think about and that can be in the the energy component again whether it's something that's renewable like wind or hydro or if it's a fossil fuel or if it's even something like geothermal, right, which is another type of power source. But even if we can take it and solve all the problems on that side, we've got this other part, which is I, as a consumer, am going to want more energy when the weather's at extremes, when it's really hot or really cold. And is the distribution system in place going to be enough to handle what weather might throw at it? Because always building to weather extremes, which is what we're trying to do more and more, is expensive, right? I know somebody who had to, that was building a, a new home in a coastal area near where I am, and they were having to build it to standards that are greater than that location has ever experienced or has experienced within the last hundred years. And it may never experience, but I can tell you if it does, they'll be glad that they expended that money. But that is expensive. And for some people that have the cash to be able to do that, that's great, but not everybody can, or it's not always realistic, particularly in the developing parts of the world. Kind of some of the stuff we talked about last week. Maybe it's not always as realistic and and again, I've seen it in places where the distribution system, you could have a, you know, a nice strong wind and some stuff would come over or get uprooted in ways that would cause a failure in the system. And it's not necessarily realistic to think you're going to make that investment. 
So I think weather will continue to do that until such a time as follows. I think the only way we ever get beyond that is, is a couple of things. One is energy creation gets more local. And I mean local is in where you are. So let's take as an example the building I live in. That the roof would have solar panels and some sort of wind turbine that's efficient that could utilize those things to create energy. Heck, even the drainage system might have for, for the water might have some sort of inline turbine that could create some amount of energy, maybe not huge amounts, but something. But again, all that's going to be expensive, and the technologies aren't there yet, but maybe someday they are. The other component that I think would have to change is we get storage to where we don't have to worry about the volatility in the short term. Again, we're not there today, and I don't know how cost-effective it'll ever be. We, you know, It's an area that we've struggled with, and I know there's a lot of minds working on the challenge today, but we've struggled with quality storage, at least that is at a reasonable size and at a reasonable cost that justifies it in an everyday case. Not to say that you know we don't have these examples, whether it's you know Elon Musk doing something or whoever. We are seeing more cases, and I do think we're going to see more use of storage like that going forward, but it's not inexpensive. And you can't just easily say to the world, hey, here's here's a battery that can keep your house going for two days or three days or four days if for some reason you can't generate power or receive power easily during that time. We're not there yet. Those will be the things that change it, is when energy creation becomes truly more of a localized thing for everywhere, that there's enough different types, enough different ways to do it, that you're not dependent on any type of weather element and or the storage changes. In the meantime, continue to look for how weather and energy do this dance where we try to get better at understanding the weather influences, harnessing the weather influences, like we talked about last year, right? When we talked about, can you imagine if we could leverage lightning bolts and hurricanes and what that would do? So maybe we will. Maybe that's where we go with weather and energy. But no matter where we might end up down the road in trying to, and again, I don't think we ever get away from the relationship, maybe stabilize the relationship. But until then, there's going to be a lot of turmoil, right? Not always smooth sailing. A little bit of rocky roller coaster, if you will, in this delicate weather energy dance.